Hi, and good evening to this CPD webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, I've started a little bit early tonight because I thought I would treat you to something special just in case you've not made your New Year's resolution just yet. And so um, I'm going to show you um, how simple it is to record CPD using the CPD Me app. So if you haven't already thought of a New Year's resolution, well, maybe this little demonstration might just change the way that you capture and record CPD. So uh, I can already see people are engaged in the chat, which is fabulous. So I will come back to the chat in a second, but I'm just going to show you how simple it is to record CPD using the CPD Me app. So just let me uh, pop up my chat so I can see that. And then uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, now is normally the point where my mum rings. So um, if the phone does ring, I'll have to put it down, but uh, hopefully you should be able to, uh, to see my uh, screen. So if I go to my CPD Me app, uh, what will happen tomorrow, as I would normally explain starting the webinar, is um, you will get a certificate for tonight's webinar. If you're a member of CPD Me, that will appear automatically by email and also pre-populate the CPD Me system. So if you look there, I can see one entry this month on the My Front screen. And if I click into my entries, you can see at the very top there that uh, I've already got an entry called The Shocking Truth About IGELs presented by Jamie Todd. So when I did my research back in 2009 to suggest some of the barriers of recording CPD, the first one was, what do I do with all this evidence? The second one was, it takes me too long to think about recording CPD, so I won't bother starting in the first place. And the third one was, I don't have time because I'm a busy health or social care professional. So what I normally say to people at this point is start the clock and just see how quickly I can capture CPD even quicker when CPD me makes that entry for you after attending tonight's live webinar. So you can see I've already got a title. I've already got the date. I just need to go in there, click on to edit. Now, when I click on to edit, you can see on my screen then that uh, I'm just going to modify this entry because it's already generated it for you with the title, the date, and the evidence. And then all that I need to do is ultimately go in there and change um, what I did, why I did it, and how that will change my practice. So I'm going to put in there, it's one hour of CPD, and it's already put in there the start date. So I don't need to put an end date in because it's just tonight. Save and continue. My governing body is the HCPC because I'm a paramedic. So I'm going to select that. Save and continue. This is where the magic happens. So what you need to write here is what you did, why you did it, and how that might influence or change your practice. So if you're really smart, you click the little dictate button at the bottom right hand side. Attended a webinar presented by Jamie in relation to managing the airway, specifically using an IGL, full stop. Taking part in this webinar will support my learning, but more importantly, allow me to select the correct airway had my patient have an airway compromise, full stop. This learning and development will support my practice and ensure that I keep up to date, but more importantly, keep an accurate record of my learning and development as required by my governing body, full stop. Next line, next line. Taking part in this webinar has also prompted me to do some further reading and research, which will also support my learning and development moving forward, full stop. So there might be a couple of spelling mistakes in there. It struggles sometimes with my Lancashire accent, but you can see that it's quite simple and I've already generated 103 words. What have you done? Why have you done it? How will it change your practice? Click on the little help option. It tells you what to write. Save and continue. I'm gonna map this to my HCPC standards always make sure you understand the standards don't just tick them because it's easy save and continue if there's a web address in there i can put the web address if i want a reminder in 12 months to recheck this cpd entry i can click that box and if i want to attach more evidence you can see there that i've already got the certificate you can see there that's sat there nicely but equally if i want to capture some more evidence so i have done some further learning so i've downloaded the bmj journal i'm going to click on capture I'm going to click on document scanner. So this would mean ultimately you can backdate things, you can forward date things and plan things, but anything you've got a paper copy of, you can digitize. So I'm going to hover that over this document. And then that's going to capture that document. Click on to next. It's then going to capture that document. Click on to done. It's then going to ask me if I want to censor anything. So it might be a thank you letter, at which point I can just touch the screen 
and block off anything what needs centering or if I don't want to click the blue button and go back if I'm happy with that click onto done at the top right hand corner and that will be my second piece of supporting evidence to support documenting or recording your CPD now ultimately it takes on average of about two minutes to use the app you can see there now that I've got my webinar certificate uploaded I've got my BNJ document uploaded click on to save and submit and that is virtually it folks that is as simple as it is to capture your recording and development and when it comes to building your complete portfolio you can do that using our website in literally two minutes and as you can see now i've already completed that it's almost complete there's probably just a few more fields missing so 88 percent and you can see there if i click onto it and click onto a preview that should allow a preview so everything that i've typed in there should allow nicely so you can see there it's already formatted it i don't need to think about that there's my certificate and there's the document that i've attached myself so capturing and recording cpd made simple doesn't get much easier than that I'd, well i maybe some maybe there's a bit of bias involved in there but but i don't think it gets any easier than that so um good evening welcome to tonight's cpd webinar uh, let me stop sharing that screen now because my mum will guaranteedly ring um just at the point where um where I, I no, you're not late. Who's Gareth? You're definitely not late. I started five minutes early because I've just showed people how to use the CPD me app in case uh, they weren't uh, or they haven't generated um, a uh, a New Year's resolution. So um, I'm interested. First of all, I can see lots of people have typed in the chat. I'm sure Jamie's hiding in the background there because we went live early tonight, uh, and I've all just had four messages saying, "What have you done to your head, Andrew?" Uh, I fell over New Year's Eve completely stone cold sober i'm gonna tell you hands up tripped out of a lift went full blast and then ended up having to glue my own head my life it pretty much pretty much sums the start of 2023 up to me so i'm interested if you pop into the chat where you're dialing in from tonight maybe what do you do for a living and absolutely did you create a new year's resolution and did, if you did we're three days in now did you honestly stick to it because i'm, I'm generally interested in knowing so um let me just stop that screen sharing and then uh that's all gone uh, we are sold out tonight so over a thousand people registered for tonight's webinar uh, which normally means about 500 will turn up uh, and we're gonna hand over to jamie shortly talking all things eye gels so where are we spencer good evening new year happy new year uh, spencer and we've got carmen from north london well that's where i was carmen in london so uh, if you're part of london ambulance service you very nearly got a phone call but very luckily I, uh, I I managed to have some glue in my uh, overnight bag. Uh, Daryl, good evening, Happy New Year. Great to have you back on board, Daryl. Recognise your name. Uh, John, uh, Wendell, Paul, Tony, uh, howdy old Michael. <laughs> this is very North, very um, Nashville-y. Uh, Stephanie, who's an ODP from crew. Evening, Stephanie. Happy New Year, everybody. Paramedic from um, Norwich. Uh, good evening, Rosalie. Uh, evening, Josh. Uh, we've got Carol. Oh, gosh, there's lots, lots and lots and lots here now. Uh, and paramedic from Cheshire. Uh, evening, Sean. Uh, Sharon, who's a senior ODP from uh, Oxford. Lots and lots. Uh, paramedic in the Peak District, working remotely. David, it, I bet it's cold up there. You've got a good jacket. So, uh, lots and lots and lots. I'll read a few more out later. Uh, actually, do you know what? We, we are, I'm noticing we're getting lots more physios and ODPs uh, coming on these webinars, which is fabulous news um, because we are to be shared by everybody who's in the learning and development field. Uh, Craig, who's a research paramedic from Southampton. Good evening, Craig. Always good to have someone in the research field with us all. Uh, happy new year uh, first year student paramedic from liverpool john moore's university well daniel welcome on board buddy uh, there is nothing you won't learn from these webinars i can tell you because i'm a bit of a paramedic veteran uh, you won't look it i know apart from a little scratch on my head but um i've been around a few years uh, but i still pick up some new tips and tricks on these webinars uh do alan pre-hospital instructor from scotland uh, evening alan i nearly did a scottish accent then but i wouldn't be very good at it if i did uh, and who have I got down here? Sue, practice educator from NWAS. Good evening, Sue. Very close to my heart. I still do the occasional shift for our Northwest Ambulance Service. And uh, we have got a, a Lewis, who's a paramedic student year two from Glasgow. Uh, brilliant to have you on board. Uh, I don't know whether this is common knowledge or not, but did you know that students across the entire footprint of the UK can use CPDME completely free of charge? Well, if you didn't, now you do. So you can tell all your student friends to drop our support team a message. Uh, Anna, who's an ED doctor, great to have you on board, Anna. Uh, Adrian from Northern Ireland, great to have you on board. And uh, first contact practitioner, uh, paramedic from Northeast. Uh, my news resolution is to get the body. Of <laughs> yes, Jamie Oliver. Yeah, indeed, all of that. Um, I've been practicing 42 years, David. Good egg. 
good egg and learn something new at every webinar. Great, great, great learning tip. Uh, right, let me get underway now. So you've already worked out chat. It's great to have people engage in the chat section. So um, let me start tonight's uh, slides and then we can hand over to Jamie. Uh, where are we? Desktop two. So the shocking truth about Agiles, what should, what you should have been taught about them. Um, what's my experience of Agiles? Uh, I probably don't do very much critical care, uh, significantly unwell patients anymore. Uh, my bag is probably very similar to the um, first point contact practitioner. Uh, I'm a bit of an urgent care buff, so um, I can't even remember the last time I used an Agil. I equally can't remember the last time I, I intubated somebody to the point where I probably would not intubate anybody again because uh, confidence and competence and all of that metrics of learning. So, where in our rules and facts? We can't see or hear you. I can't see you yet, Jamie. I don't know if you turn your camera on. Uh, but if you're sat there in your Versace dressing gown because you've had one bought for Christmas or maybe your silk uh, smoking jacket, don't worry because we can't see you. So you don't need to fumble around trying to hide your camera. And equally, we can't hear you. So if you're eating crisps or nuts or maybe Ferrero Rocher's that are left over from Christmas, uh, don't worry because I can't hear you. Good evening, Please Andy. Do... <laughs> uh, apparently, apparently you've turned my camera off so I can't turn it on. Really? What, what have you pressed? Oh, I don't know. Let's have a look. Um, it says the host has stopped my video. Uh, for no reason, Jamie, because you're aesthetically pleasing to the eye, generally. So, That's let, very kind. <laughs> let me just try. Is, let me try it now. Does that, does that work? Unlike yourself, it's got a face for radio. <laughs> I've got, you're lucky I've not got a patch over one eye tonight. Nope. Can't open my, can't open my video. It says, really? Can't start your video because your host has stopped it. That, well, that's strange. Let me make you a co-host um, and see if that see if that changes things. Does that change things? Nope, same. Anyway, I'll have a play with the buttons in a minute once I've um, introduced you. <laughs> so, gosh knows. Welcome to 2023. If you have any questions for Jamie, now we know he's there, uh, please do put them into the Q&A box. So you should have a Q&A box in, in your um, options. So chat is for interacting with each other. And maybe if, if Jamie throws a question out, Q&A box is for questions and answers. And as you've seen on my demo earlier, your certificates, if you are a premium member, will come in the morning when Fabio and the team and Amy and Jessica have had their cups of coffee and their work and shake, they'll get your certificates out. And that will automatically drop into your portfolio. So if you have downloaded the app and you are a member, it will pre-populate it. We just ask you that you then go in and refer Reflect what you've learned, how that might influence the change of practice, and that completes the learning circle. And of course, you will get access to the recording. So if you have to shoot away tonight, it will be live on YouTube for about 24 hours, and then it'll give you a chance to catch up on it. And then, if you are on social media, it's always good to see you learning, see where you're learning. So if you're sat in a response car, or maybe um, working in a hospital, or maybe you're working from home, do take us a snap. Captures maybe if you're having a drink, a cup of coffee, maybe a glass of wine, maybe you've given up uh, alcohol for the new year. Maybe you're just still eating crisps and nuts. Do a snap and make sure you tag us in with CPD Made Simple. And of course, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and um, most social media channels. It's always good to get some feedback from you. So I will post some feedback links shortly in the chat. It's always good if you do. And we normally give away two £20, uh, £25 Amazon vouchers for tonight's webinar, one today, one tomorrow. And then, of course, um, if we do use your post, then we will contact you and let you know that we're going to use it for our social media marketing. So why use CPD Me? Well, if you were here at 5-2, because we had hundreds of people lined up to get in the door, so I opened it early you will see that capturing and recording your CPD using our app is really, really simple. You get access to 80 live recordings, automatic CPD certificates, as well as lots of other great benefits that you see on screen. So lots of reasons to join us. So uh, while Jamie is, well, I'm trying to activate Jamie's camera, uh, I'm going to hand over to Jamie's screen now. So let me stop sharing my screen, Jamie. Um, and then I'm going to change the host to you to see if, um, see if this makes any difference. So. Um, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> right. Let me let me hand over to you and see if this works. Yeah, the cameras come on. I've no idea what happened, Jamie. But look at you, fab looking fabulous as always. There we go. We're there. Are, the are we good? All are, yours. We, are we good to go? All yours. Uh. I need to stop you screen sharing so I can share. Here we go. 
Okay, can anyone confirm you can see the screen? Loud and clear. Yeah, you see the first slide, okay? Perfect. Lovely, perfect. Okay, good evening and uh, welcome everyone back to uh, my monthly uh, webinar. And uh, as promised, this one uh, about eye gels. And uh, we titled it The Shocking Truth About Eye Gels. So good evening all and good evening to intersurgical lawyers who are probably watching as well, uh, just in case I say something bad about their product. Uh, but that's not going to be the case. We're just going to learn a lot about them. So what should we have been taught about the use of eye gels? Let's make our way forwards into up to an hour about talk on eye gels. Uh, question box is uh, open. So if you have any questions, then uh, just pop them in there and we'll get to them in some time at the end. Make sure I can see the chat box as well. Lovely. There we go. So what do we know? Oh, now we've got a ah, we're away. Click enough buttons, it'll go eventually. So first, we need to cover some definitions. I guess that's always a good place to start is to make sure we're talking about the right thing. So we know eye gel by their brand uh, as a device by the brand name, and we're also very familiar with the uh, term LMA laryngeal mask airway, uh, which is also a brand. I think a Teleflex one now. I think uh, was a sort of a separate company and uh, that uh, invented the original um, uh, airways of this type. Uh, but actually, there's some wider definitions that we probably need to be aware of. So overall, when we're teaching airway stuff, we'd refer to them as extraglottic airway devices. So by definition, these are devices used to establish an airway without entering the trachea. Uh, and as we are all well aware, you know, very commonly used in the pre-hospital environment around the world emergency department, and particularly in the operating room uh, for, for routine operations, the vast majority is done using one of this type of device uh, internationally, uh, intubation being relatively rare. Uh, so yeah, the overall term would be EGD, extraglottic uh, device, and that covers all devices. And I suppose you could argue that therefore maybe OP airways and MP airways are an extraglottic device. Uh, we tend to treat those as sort of an adjunct, aren't they? Because the, the ventilation device is really then, I guess, the mask. Uh, so then extra lot of devices is split down into two groups. Um, are SGAs, or sometimes you'll see it in the UK referred to as SAD, supraglottic airway device, SAD devices. Uh, but supraglottic airways are those that sit on top of the pharyngeal opening, uh, providing some sort of seal over the top allowing ventilation directly into the trachea uh, and, and the tip of it in many ways, um, occluding the esophagus. Uh, so that's uh, the eye gel type, LMA, uh, LMA Supreme, uh, Ambi or again, all these sort of brands uh, of uh, SGAs. Uh, and then also something we're not quite so familiar with in the uh, UK, but some of our uh, European uh, partners I can see uh, are online tonight. Uh, and people from uh, other countries may be more familiar with some of the retroglottic devices. Uh, the most common being the King Airway or Laryngeal Tube, as it's branded in Europe. Uh, and that's a device that's actually, if you've never seen one, we're going to show you a picture of one in a minute, but it's a device that's actually specifically designed to go in blindly, and the tip of it goes into the esophagus, uh, because we know from bad intubation that if you stick things blindly into the mouth, it'll go into the esophagus. So they made a device that just did that. Uh, and then the cuff blows up in the esophagus and seals that, uh, and a cuff blows up um, in the oropharynx. And the air then comes out through a hole in between in the tube uh, and will end up going down the trachea. So it uh, works in a very different way, but achieves the same thing without uh, having to do the tricky thing of getting something down the trachea. And if you look at the resource council guidelines, then uh, all these uh, extraglottic airway devices are classified in the group of advanced airways, the same as intubation. So uh, they come into that sort of advanced airway uh, group um, for resuscitation. So I suppose we're talking about resuscitation. We have to understand uh, partly about why we use devices. And I think it's really important to remember, um, if you've ever watched any decent, uh, some of the really good presentations about uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest, particularly in the pre-hospital setting, uh, and the different papers that have compared different airway devices have gone through a number of years of 
uh, comparing airway devices in cardiac arrest, uh, like King Airway and uh, in the PARC trial in the US and Airways 2 in the UK uh, and a trial in France of intubation versus BVM, all uh, well-known papers. Um, but actually, we don't really have any massive survival benefit of intubation over the extraglottic devices. Uh, but likewise, we don't actually have any direct comparisons between extraglottic devices and bag mass ventilation. Uh, apart from extrapolating the data from other studies. But we definitely have no clear evidence that putting an eye gel into patients in out-of-hospital or cardiac arrest improves uh, meaningful survival. Uh, and I think that's important to recognize in the fact that when we're about setting our priorities about what we do in resuscitation, uh, because we do see where people are very panicky and worried right at the start, they must get the eye gel in and that comes to the teaching they've had. You know, it's a real priority to get the IGL in because it's going to make a difference. And we really have no evidence of that. So it's really important that we sort of recognize that in our use of airway devices. So if that's the case, then, you know, if it says in the ALS algorithm, doesn't it, you know, uh, use an advanced airway when you're ready, effectively, it's not a priority. Yeah, and an IGL is an advanced airway. Uh, why do we use them? Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a few things, you know, I think firstly, like many other things that help us in resuscitation, one of the things to do is it frees up hands. So we no longer need to get a good mask seal, yeah, you know, which we might be able to do on most patients with an appropriate technique. But if we don't need to get an appropriate mask seal, then, uh, you know, that frees up some hands, which is uh, good. Uh, and freeing up hands gives us bandwidth. Uh, and then we have more bandwidth, we can make better decisions. And we know if we send more people to a cardiac arrest, we can think more widely and have a sort of a, a greater overview of what's going on and why they might be in cardiac arrest and all that sort of thing. So it definitely has an advantage there, sort of a uh, non-technical advantage in sort of uh, freeing up hands of created bandwidth. Now, of course, there is some patients, uh, when we teach about bag mask ventilation, there's some patients that we can't easily uh, ventilate with a bag valve mask device. Uh, then uh, the people who like, uh, with uh, large beards or people that have got no teeth in the elderly where their facial structure has collapsed and they lose that sort of um, soft tissue elasticity as well. There are other number of groups that, you know, may, may not be uh, great to uh, 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 ventilate with a bag valve mask. It could be, um, you know, they've got facial damage or whatever it might be. So there's a place there, isn't there, for moving uh, onto another uh, device and the eye gel may well have a place there. And I think as well for uh, gastric protection as well, you know, we've managed to show in Airways too that actually the eye gel had an equal level of gastric protection as an ET tube, which probably suggested that the person had aspirated prior to our interventions, maybe during the bag mass ventilation side, if they received excessive ventilations possibly. Um, so we know that these devices do provide uh, good, in fact, better than we think, uh, gastric protection and airways too managed to prove that. But if you look at the French BVM uh, versus ET tube uh, study, uh, where obviously the BVM group had much higher rates of aspiration, it didn't actually affect survival, uh, uh, influence survival. So, um, you know, that isn't a, a thing that affects survival. But then nobody wants vomit everywhere. So uh, gastric protection sounds like a good thing. So why eye gel? Yeah, so, you know, of all the airway devices, there is a number of supraglottic airway devices, all of which have pros and cons. And there's a uh, probably only one major retroglossic device now, the King laryngeal tube. There was others historically. Uh, the combi tube was the original sort of version, but you needed a degree in physics uh, to figure out how to work the thing. It had so many tubes and cuffs and so on. Uh, so these are the two direct comparisons. Uh, and I think uh, we're in quite a silo in the UK because unless you've uh, worked anywhere else, you see that, you know, actually, I think now every um, NHS ambulance service uh, in the UK uh, uses iGel uh, pretty much exclusively now in all sizes. So, you know, we can be in a silo and think, well, you know, this is the right device. This is what we should use. But actually, the King laryngeal tube device uh, pictured on the right there, that's the one with the gastric port in. Um, probably has a uh, wider use across the world. It's used extensively across Europe um, and in the Americas uh, and in the Far East and so on. So, um, you know, if, if we think that iGel is the most common device, we'd definitely be wrong. Yeah, the King is definitely the most common device. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, um, why IGEL? Well, I think the, the general discussion has been around sort of ease of insertion uh, and so on, but we're going to learn quite a lot about that. So I guess we should consider why do we choose anything? Yeah, you know, why do how do we choose the equipment that's on our ambulances? And that brings up a whole question in itself. And I think this is the best example I came up with for why do we choose anything? Um, and uh, the fact it made traffic light colors pleased me tremendously afterwards, but it was purely accident. And so I looked at the slide. So to the left, we have our extrication board, obviously something we try and avoid using uh, unless we need to squeeze someone out of a tight space. Yeah. Um, and then in the middle, we have our scoop stretcher, which is the thing we most like to put uh, patients on that require some form of spinal motion restriction, uh, even though it was never made for that. It was a lifting device. Uh, they've never made them long enough because they were built in the 1970s and never made them any longer. So now they're too short for everyone. So they just got a maximum length. Um, they don't like to clip together on rough ground. Um, they sometimes jam and won't unclip uh, and lots of other things. Now, if only someone made a device that was both those devices put together and clipped together on rough ground and the head immobilizer worked and the straps are better and it was cheaper than the other two together, that would be the one on the right, the combi carrier. But they're almost unheard of in the UK and a couple of places have got them. Um, but we're we're very um, uh, traditional, aren't we? we? We don't like change. Yeah, so we've had scoop stretchers on the ambulance since the 1970s, so we're going to keep buying scoop stretchers, uh, even though it's a better device. So I think that really reflects about you know how how we equip ambulances and how we choose things. There really isn't a lot of uh, thought behind it sometimes. So we get to the crunch point. What is the shocking truth about eye gels? So uh, fortunately, if intersurgical lawyers are online. Yeah, then it's not something bad. Yeah, the truth about eye gels is that the eye gel is an excellent device. Yeah, it does work really well. And we're going to look at some data that shows that in a minute. Uh, the problem we see with eye gels, and I see in practice uh, all the time, is that they're not used great. You know, they're, 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 the education provided to people uh, about eye gel use is not good. Uh, probably, I'm, as you're probably aware, I run a lot of airway courses and we have a session on extra glock devices. And some of the key points you have to know about iGel, I would say even now, 95% of paramedics who come on our airway courses don't know those key points. So that's a real problem uh, in the education that's being provided um, around the iGel device. And I think that comes from it being what seems apparently quite an easy device to use. So the truth is, it's a great device, but it's not easy to use. And we have some big uh, uh, educational problems around the eye gel. Some good stuff going on in the chat there. Uh, so where does that take us? I've lost my mouse. Come back, mouse. All is forgiven. There we go. So uh, Airways 2 trial. Yeah, for, I'm sure everyone's perfectly aware of this. Yeah, a really big. Uh, airways trial, 4,000 patients in each group, approximately uh, direct comparison in pre-hospital, uh, out of hospital, cardiac arrest, uh, looking at uh, the effects of this as supraglottic airway device, but it was IGEL versus tracheal intubation. Uh, if we just look at uh, initial ventilation success with uh, up to two attempts, uh, then uh, we know intubation was yeah just under 70%, which wasn't very good. Uh, but uh, iGel achieved 87.8%, uh, almost 88% uh, success in under two attempts, which is obviously considerably better. Um, but the sort of uh, paper that I put into this uh, only two days ago that I managed to find, uh, which is looking at the comparison of uh, King and iGel airway devices in our hospital cardiac arrest. And uh, I only spotted this the other day. So I put the link there for you. Um, I'm sure if you take a picture of the link or uh, if you're subscribed, you can get it afterwards um, from the recorded presentation. Uh, and this was quite interesting. It's looked at a number of attempts to a uh, successful insertion for a superglottic airway. Uh, and with one attempt, uh, the king was getting about 88.6%, which is, uh, you know, uh, very similar to what our iGEL success rate was in 82. But there, the iGEL rate was 93.5. Uh, so, yeah, really good success rate. Uh, and, you know, only a very uh, small number at three attempts. So they were, you know, only 0.9% off, a, a, you know, 99.1% by two attempts, uh, whereas the king required more attempts. So a really useful bit of information, um, you know, as to the success of the devices. And we know that 
Uh, 90% generally is our marker line for successful things. Yeah, there's no 100% in medicine and definitely not in the super great complex world of pre-hospital care. Yeah, so I'm always generally very happy. If something is 90% successful, then that's a good thing. You know, we, we say in some of the courses that we teach, 90% is 100% in our world. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's those are good numbers. So it shows that, you know, given the right education and so on, the device can be really, really successful. So when is it less likely to work? Yeah, and I think we should be aware of that. And it isn't always going to say that we won't do it uh, because, you know, it may be the only option that's available to us, depending on what our scope of practice is. Yeah, but we should always be aware of when things are less likely to work in mean, our sort of prediction model of airway management, because then we're not surprised if they don't work. And then we've already formulated a plan as to what we're going to do next. So in our sort of less likely group is our hypothermic patients. Uh, remember, we also need to debunk. I think finally managed to get rid of the old myth that you know, the, uh, they didn't work when the eye gel was cold. The, the eye gel is a very stable device. The, the gel in the eye gel is very stable at routine temperatures. Um, we have thrown one in a freezer before at minus 23 to see what happens. And then, yes, it does become um, very um, quite rigid. Yeah, but that's a fairly unusual temperature. Um, so, yeah, it's the patient being cold. Because the eye gel doesn't mold to the patient, the patient molds to the eye gel. So when it sits into its site, it relies on the patient's soft tissue working around the eye gel uh, to, make a, to make the best seal and sealing around the eye gel. So our cold patients, there may be an expectation that it's not going to work. Uh, yeah, our drownings, just because the volume of water in their stomach as a whole, you know, most of the drownings we see that have gone into the walls are conscious. It's their stomach that's full of water. And so there's going to be a huge amount of pressure up against the uh, esophageal seal. Um, so we might have problems there, uh, but the gastric port might save us. So I'm not saying we're not going to try it, but it's an expectation. Uh, those with tight airways, so asthmatic, COPDs, et cetera. Um, you know, and so you know, we're looking at preventing the effects of sort of power trauma from hyperventilation and so on. Although, of course, you could argue that a device that has a leak actually stops you overventilating the patient, giving them bilateral tension pneumothoraxes, um, which you can uh, very easily do with an ET tube in. So uh, maybe the leak is telling you you're actually ventilating too hard and not fixing the problem, but trying to ventilate the patient out of it. Uh, or diaphragmatic splinting, which obviously occurs in late stage pregnancy uh, or could occur because someone's... Um, aggressively double-handedly bag vast man ventilated the patient at 30 breaths a minute and inflated the stomach with loads of gas uh, or for other reasons so anywhere that where the diaphragm is splinted we also might have difficulty with any of the extra glottic devices these are sort of things that might create complications so if only there was a mnemonic that could help us with that unfortunately there is what i've done is lifted the one from our uh, airway courses yeah so our prediction of difficulty uh, in extra glossy device placement and use and someone just put in the chat thing the yeah, pregnancy versus morbidly obese yeah it's going to have the same effect doesn't it uh, on diaphragmatic splinters to a degree uh prediction difficulty with extra glossy placement and use so what can the rods mnemonic tell us about the prediction of difficulty yeah so obviously restricted mouth opening is a big concern uh, and probably more so for eye gel than the other um, extra glossy devices uh, because of the ready-made sort of uh, gel cuff on the end of the eye gel, it probably requires the most space to get it in versus something like an LMA Supreme with an inflatable cuff where you can actually make the device quite small. So there is a slight disadvantage to eye gel there. You do need a, re a, a decent amount of mouth opening and space in the mouth to get the thing in. Yeah, so that probably is a general eye gel um, thing that may not affect other extra glock devices that we should be aware of. So that's our R. Uh, obstruction, so we know if there's an obstruction at the level of the larynx or so on, then placing a device on top of that is not going to make any difference. Uh, and certainly there's a concern, particularly with eye gel, that if there is an obstruction there and you push the eye gel in because of the bulk of its cuff, it could actually push some sort of obstruction down further. And that probably is a greater risk with eye gel than other extra glottic devices because of the bulky cuff, it might push things down the glottic opening a little bit more. 
if there's an unidentified obstruction there, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. We talk about setup for eye gel insertion. All the morbidly obese are going to come into that same group, aren't they? Require high airway pressures. Disruption or distortion, we have to recognize that all extra lock devices that have a cuff of some sort were made to fit normal people. They were made for routine surgery. Almost nothing is made for pre-hospital care or abnormal patients. It is all made for the big market. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the device is made by scanning lots of people and taking lots of measurements and then making a range of cuffs that fit them. Yeah, but if the person's got some sort of disruption of that, trauma to the airway or swelling, like inhalational burns, anaphylaxis, et cetera, all these things, even if you can get the device in, there is a chance it won't seal um, because the airway is no longer the shape that the device was made to fit. Yeah, so there, there can be a concern there as well. Again, it's not coming back to the point that if it's, you know, if it's the limit of our scope of practice or it's what we need to try right now, we're not going to try it. You know, well, absolutely, we might try it. But again, it's about our expectation of is this going to work or not. Uh, and we don't have uh, in the eye gel uh, something, something that can be damaged. That's a good thing about eye gel. There's no cuff to damage or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, in other devices with cuffs, then things like tongue uh, piercings and sharp teeth uh, can damage the cuff on the way in if they're being put in with some force. And then obviously you'll have no cuff and no seal. And then finally, our stiff lungs, as we mentioned, our asthmatics, our COPD patients, these sort of people may require high airway pressures, but they're also super high risk. Yeah, um, if we are providing high pressure, we need to do that incredibly carefully. That's our mnemonic, our ROD's mnemonic. So what about sizing? And this is where the biggest education generally goes on in IGEL. Yeah, um, we know the IGELs are sized by weight and there's the official sort of chart. Yeah, although I think having things like small adult, medium adult, large adult in the patient size is not very helpful yeah, um, because it, that's not how we size them particularly. Yeah, they're sized by the weight guidance on the right. Yeah, and, uh, and the range goes all the way from neonate. And if anyone's done uh, neonatal life support recently, then uh, the size one eye gel is the preferred adjunct um, over OP airway now. Um, so it'd be the, the first uh, adjunct to be inserted if you need to use an adjunct you can't just use a bag mask on its own uh, and we're very familiar with the sizes three to five the label adult sizes but not so with the peed sizes one to three you know so i said if you know what's the right size eye gel for a 10 kilo child and you know they'll look away and i'll look away because i don't know either you know we, we want to look it up um, so the thing we need to note now is the size four weight range there. Yeah, the size four weight range is really important. Yeah, so the green size four eye gel, 50 to 90 kilos is something we need to remember for the next slide. So we have a bit of a Christmas theme. Yeah, so uh, why ideal body weight? And this is the bit that probably 95% of the paramedics that come on our airway courses don't know. Yeah. They don't know that the weight range on eye gels is ideal body weight, not um, the weight of the patient you're looking at. Yeah, it's the weight they should be. Yeah, because of course, it doesn't matter how many Christmas dinners you've been forced to eat with relatives you don't even like. Yeah, your airway doesn't get any bigger. Yeah, your airway stays the same size of the patient you should be, not the size of the patient you are. Yeah, so they're definitely sized by ideal body weight. Now, this sounds horrid because we're quite poor at uh, predicting patients' body weight anyway. That's a very difficult thing to do. We're quite good at predicting people's height. Now, in hospital, of course, it's not a concern. Someone's saying, how do you weigh the patient? Well, yeah, it's very tricky. Yeah, because in hospital, we can, you know, the, the chances are the patient might have been weighed. Yeah, uh, but even then, that will only give you their actual body weight, not their ideal body weight. So, you know, how do we work out which size eye gel to use? We've got to work out the patient's ideal body weight. Well, the good news is, yeah, that uh, the patient's ideal body weight is linked to their height. But your ideal body weight is pretty much ultra thin. Yeah, it's the weight we as human beings should be, but, um, you know, uh, stopped being a long time ago when McDonald's opened. Uh, we also have to remember that in the morbidly obese, you know, they may have extra tissue in there, so they may end up with um, a slightly smaller airway and they definitely end up with a smaller tidal volume because of the mass on their chest. Yeah, so they're the trickiest patients. 
this is the chart that we use when we're teaching ventilation. Yeah, this is the ideal body weight chart. And I've highlighted two areas uh, for males and females. So we said the size four eye gel is 50 to 90 kilos of ideal body weight. So that goes in males from five foot yeah, to six foot five. Yeah, so from five foot to six foot five, uh, they're a size four eye gel. Yeah, and that's a big range of people. That's pretty much all adult males. There's not many adult males that are under five foot, and there's not many adult males that are over six foot five. Yeah, it doesn't matter how heavy they actually are. Yeah, that weight range is the ideal body weight range. And in females, because their ideal body weight is slightly higher, yeah, and it's from five foot two to six foot three. And I think it stops at six foot three just because it's very rare to get females that are taller than that. Yeah, but even there, they're only 80 kilos. So basically all females above five foot two are a size four eye gel. Uh, and all males above five foot, but under six foot five are a size four eye gel. And that's really important. Yeah, so size four should our, be our default position. And our question should be, when we're looking at a patient, why are they not a four, an adult patient? Yeah, they've got to be under five foot or over six foot five. Yeah, if they're a male, it doesn't matter how much Greg's they've had. Yeah, it makes no difference whatsoever to their airway size. Yeah, the important thing is the ideal body weight. So why do we see size three eye gels in size four patients? This is something I'd see reasonably often. Yeah, when I turn up at a hospital cardiac arrest and I'm doing a review of what's going on, one well, of the first things I'll ask is, what airway are we using? We're using an eye gel. What size eye gel is it? Because one of the problems is that when the eye gel is in the patient's mouth, uh, you can't tell what size it is because the number is on the side of it. Generally, it's just inside the patient's uh, mouth, just, just by their teeth, and you can't see the size that easily. Uh, anyone who's really old like me, and Andy obviously is quite old, yeah, will remember that when eye gels first came out, the eye gels themselves were actually coloured. Yeah, so the eye gels were um, yellow, green, and orange. The actual gel was, so you could tell what size was in the patient. Uh, but obviously, it was cheaper to make them all in green. Uh, so uh, now you need to ask what size it is. So why do we three size, see size threes and size four patients? Yeah, um, there's two, two things to blame. Firstly, I blame mannequins. and uh, Secondly, uh, lazy educators. Uh, educators allow patients to put size three eye gels in recess mannequins because apparently a four doesn't fit. Yeah, and what you find is the four doesn't fit if you try and put it in dry. Uh, and I was teaching in university only a few weeks ago uh, and they were doing uh, resuscitation uh, with uh, student paramedics and every single group came around and put a size three eye gel in. So I just said, patient's not ventilating, no chest rise, no chest rise, no chest rise. We'll put a size four in, chest rise. Yeah, the size four eye gel lubricated does go in the mannequin, but uh, there's a, a tendency to allow people to use size threes. Yeah, the problem with that is, of course, it forms a muscle memory. So if you get used to putting size three um, eye gels into adults in simulated cardiac arrest, that's what you do in the real world. That's how human beings work. Yeah, and also we see seal problems in mannequins. So, you know, because they don't have soft tissue, then eye gels don't seal that well uh, uh, in a face. Yeah, and someone said, yeah, you can get a form to a mannequin. Absolutely, you can, but you've got to lubricate it. Yeah, if you just try and ram it in dry, then uh, it won't go in. Yeah, so um, you often don't get a seal with, man with mannequins either because they don't have the soft tissue to seal around the eye gel. Um, so often you have to use excessive ventilation, which is also a really bad thing, to get chest rise, which is obviously a good thing. So that's, uh, you know, uh, that's down to us as educators to make sure that, you know, people are doing things in simulation the right way. So when they go into the real world, they do things in the right way. Uh, and then we come down to the question of mouth versus airway. Yeah, because obviously the two aren't linked. Yeah, the size of your mouth doesn't, um, you know, someone saying only size three fits mannequins most of the time. Uh, I should get some different mannequins. And yeah, if they're adult mannequins, and they take a size three airway, they're not a size three eye gel. And, and they are between five foot and six foot five, then they're the wrong mannequin. Yeah, um, because they're teaching bad things. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is the problem. Your mouth size doesn't reflect your airway size. Your airway size reflects, is reflected by your ideal body weight. And so there are patients who have a size four mouth, but a size three airway. So you look at their mouth, it's really big. Yeah, likewise, there's patients with a size three mouth uh, who need a size four airway. 
Yeah, and they're slightly trickier because in those patients, you know, it'd be very tempting to put a smaller one in because they've got a small mouth, but actually their airway is a size four size. The mouth size is not relevant. So we need to pick the right size of the eye gel by their height, stroke, ideal body weight, and then use good technique. Yeah, the mouth size uh, isn't going to uh, reflect it in their airway size. So, of course, we need to know our device. Yeah, and we should always know about devices. And I put the link up at the bottom there that will take you to the uh, iGel user guide. Of course, uh, we all have read the user guide because we wouldn't be those people that would use a medical device without reading the instructions for it, would we? Definitely not. Yeah, so um, we need to know our device and the parts of it and so on. Um, but uh, the bit that surprised me the most when I was looking at this again was the bit in the middle of the eye gel, which is known as the buccal cavity stabilizer. The next time you're at a cardiac arrest and you want to throw someone, you just say, can you just pass me that by the buccal cavity stabilizer? See where that gets you. Uh, interesting things like the bottom end, the epiglottic rest. Yeah, there's that little lip that sits at the top of the cuff. Yeah, which stops epiglottic folding, uh, which is a problem in uh, certainly in some of the older LMAs that didn't have uh, any sort of thing to manage that. As you push the LMA, it folded the epiglottis down uh, over the airway opening, which wasn't good. And you do hear a little word of caution. You do hear people talking about intubating through eye gels. And absolutely, it's achievable. We hear people talking about intubating through eye gels by putting bougies through it. And that is a blind technique and really not recommended. Yeah, the, uh, if you need to intubate someone through an eye gel, it should be done with a, a flexible scope, a fiber optic scope, uh, which you can then pass the bougie down. In fact, you can even do it with a bronch adapter, uh, which means you can actually ventilate the patient and put the flexible scope down and put the tube in the whole time while ventilating the patient, the eye gel then has to um, stay in, uh, but uh, the patient will have a tube in their trachea if needed. So it is possible, but uh, not just blindly with the booge is probably not recommended. So how are we going to go about our sort of uh, eye gel? So yeah, firstly, you know, good lubrication is key. Yeah, force should not be our preferred technique, and that really applies to everything, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, um, it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't be done by force. Yeah, same as laryngoscopy, everything else. Yeah, so you know, when we've selected our size of eye gel, then lubrication using the um, armor guard there, plenty on the back uh, and some around the sides, just trying to get a big lump of it in the clot in the opening, and then just fire it down there, uh, bronchial tree, which won't be very nice. Uh, do remember to take the armor guard off. There is one serious towards instrument in the UK that I'm aware of. Of a patient found with the eye gel in with the armor guard still on the eye gel not quite sure how they got it in but they weren't lunatics they're taking the outer packaging off so you know it was all okay uh but uh yeah it just shows what bandwidth can do to people isn't it sometimes uh sometimes you'll hear people saying that lubrication isn't always required yeah and uh you know that is absolutely not true yeah anyone who ever tells you that lubrication is not required in an eye gel send them around to me and I'll put a dry size for eye gel in them and we'll see how they like it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, lubrication is uh, is really good. And force is really bad. Uh, a colleague uh, that teaches on our airway courses with me not so long ago, we were discussing um, some uh, sort of uh, eye gel auditing he'd been doing uh, and torn frenulum seems to be quite a common thing. And people picking too big an eye gel and then putting it in by force, pushing the tongue back and tearing the frenulum under the tongue. Uh, which can give you some quite impressive oral bleeding, which you really don't want to see. Yeah, and that's uh, that's really a, a, a bad thing. So what are we going to do in our insertion technique? Yeah, first we're going to inspect and clear the airway. Yeah, so good opening of the mouth, yeah, for visualisation. Also lets us see how much space we've got to work with and visual inspection. Uh, if you work for London Ambulance Service, then laryngoscopy, I believe, is still mandatory. It came from a coroner's ruling a few years ago uh, about a death with an extraglottic airway. I think the patient had a plastic bag in their airway. Um, I think that the coroner's ruling was overturned by the Recess Council, uh, but it's still common uh, LAS practice uh, to, uh, to uh, have laryngoscopy first. Therefore, it's a paramedic-only device. Um, we don't teach that as uh, a routine thing. I think you need to look at the history. You know, if you've gone to a patient who's collapsed with central chest pain, they've had for two hours, they were sweat, sweaty, nauseous, etc. You know, you very strongly got a cardiac origin. 
then you know we, we may not uh, actually directly visualize the glottics with a laryngoscope but if you have any suspicion about what's happened and you've got no history if they were eating that sort of thing then absolutely i think it seems very sensible to uh you know inspect the airway yeah so always have a consideration for visualization uh removing foreign bodies and suction you know and suction can work really well uh, you can adapt the salad suction technique you've seen that for eye gels um, you know, and uh, actually clear the airway and put an eye gel in. Um, so, yeah, um, getting the airway clear and clean is as important with eye gel as anything else. Prepare the patient, yeah, because like everything, like bag mass ventilation, intubation, the more work we do with the patient, the less work we do with the device, which makes our life much easier. Yeah, so assuming no concern or priority for C spine motion restriction, and I sort of, uh, caveat that with the word priority because obviously airway would overrule c-spine in the emergency setting um you know how can we improve the patient well definitely some good mouth opening and some jaw thrust by bringing the tongue forward we're going to make it easier to get the device behind the tongue and that's actually in the manufacturer's instructions the use of jaw thrust for eye gel insertion um uh, and definitely using the sort of you know classic sniffing the morning air position that you see in the right hand slide they uh, bring in the head forwards now, sometimes described as sort of ear to sternal notch, which is probably a better description of it than sniffing the morning air. But in line, uh, lining the axis of the airway means we're going to have to do less work. And that's applicable to how air moves, getting eye gels in or intubation. Actually, position makes a big difference for inserting the device. If you've been doing bag mass ventilation first with adjuncts in, which I like to do, then uh, the OP airway will clearly need to come out. Yeah. Um, but the MP airways can stay in. They won't, they won't get in the way. So uh, if you've got uh, two MP airways in the patient, they can stay in there while you put the eye gel in. And we said insertion. Yeah, definitely not force. Yeah, good mouth opening, some jaw thrust if needed. And our straight direct insertion of a well-lubricated device should go in without any force because force will cause bleeding. And bleeding in the airway is really, really bad if you didn't have bleeding beforehand. But... This is the technique that people talk to people. So the other bit that we generally find when people come on our airway courses is no one's ever told them what to do if that doesn't work. If they go to put an eye gel in and it won't go in, and either it just sits on the tongue uh, or, you know, or doesn't go in, they can't insert it rather than it being in and not sealing. But what if it won't go in easily? Yeah, and we don't want to use force. And this is general people haven't been told. Firstly, you know, was it well lubricated? That's really important. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're going to go back and, you know, switch to an, an alternative unless we uh, quickly fix the problem. But uh, was it well lubricated? Is it the right size for the idea body weight? Yeah, have you been past the wrong one? Yeah, but you shouldn't go down a size. If it won't go in, you shouldn't change size. If it's the right one for the patient's ideal body weight, i.e. height, unless you tried some other things. Yeah, laryngoscopy can give you more space Yeah, by compressing the tongue into the submandibular space and so on. Yeah, but you obviously need to have some skill in laryngoscopy to do that. The next two techniques are the ones that work best. The first one, the deep rotation method, is in the eye gel literature. It's in the intersurgical handbook for eye gel, and yet nobody really knows it. Yeah, so you put the eye gel in down the side of the tongue with a glottic opening pointing towards the tongue and it goes around the tongue and just rotates in. And in my experience, that has worked every time. Every time I've gone to put an eye gel in directly and it's just stuck and I don't want to push, I switch to the um, deep rotation method and it goes in every single time. Yeah, so that's definitely something we need to know. And if you only have been taught one eye gel insertion technique, then you've been taught by the wrong person. And then as a last resort, and you can try this on a mannequin, it works really, really well. Yeah, then uh, you can actually put the thing in upside down. Yeah, you can actually insert the eye gel in like an OP airway, yeah, the wrong way around until it's in the back of the oropharynx and the thing will rotate around beautifully. But do remember to turn it around. Yeah, because otherwise you'll have a lot of paperwork to fill in afterwards. Yeah, but it, that or I've never had to do it though in a real patient because the second technique, the deep rotation technique, always works. Yeah, in my experience, so I uh, never had to do the uh, 180 uh, rotation trick. And only then consider changing size. 
Yeah. Obviously, if you've got put it in, you've got a massive leak. You've got to go up a size. Yeah, but only go down a size uh, if you've tried the other techniques and the eye gel still won't go in. If you if the one you have in your hand is the one for adult patients, i.e. a green size 4 eye gel almost for everyone. Uh, the deep rotation technique is on the intersurgical. Someone asked the question on the chat. Yeah, it's on the intersurgical literature for the device. Just, just go on intersurgical and look it up. Yeah, so um, you just put the uh, eye gel in with the opening facing the tongue and just rolls down the tongue and rotates in. Works every time. So we have a plan, but we have some more breaking news. Yeah, um, the eye gel will not work in all patients. Uh, and we also have to be aware of those things as well. Yeah, if... Uh, Eye gel does not work on all patients, yeah, and we have, we have to have an, expe uh, an expectation that it won't work on all patients. I had a case earlier this year where I arrived on scene and uh, an ambulance crew, uh, excellent, two crews were there, in fact, they were excellent. Um, when I got there, they said, uh, we put a size four eye gel in, it had a massive leak, so we put a size five eye gel in, and it's not really in right, but it was ventilating with a, a, a waveform. So we just sorted some other bits out because it was a bit of a, uh, a mixed cardiac arrest. Uh, it was a bit of, um, we weren't sure. I think, we think the patient might have had an MI then crashed a motorbike. So it was medical and trauma at the same time. Um, so eventually, uh, when I got back to the airway end, uh, I decided to take out the size 5 eye gel, do a bit of suction and put the 4 in, thinking they probably didn't. If the 5 was way too big, the 4 was probably okay. They probably hadn't seated it right. Uh, but no, the ambulance crew were absolutely right. This patient was not a size 4 eye gel, and they weren't a size 5 eye gel either. Yeah, um, so what are your options then? Well, that patient got an ET tube in, uh, because I already had the laryngoscope in my hand, uh, and the equipment ready. Uh, of course, we could go back and use bag valve mass technique with OP, two MPs, because going back to our original evidence, looking at you know, uh, the effect of airway devices on ad hospital cardiac arrest, we have no evidence that ventilating someone with a bag valve mask gives them a lesser chance of survival um, directly, um, as far as we're aware currently. There's been no direct study comparison. Connect to an airway circuit, and someone was already winding me up on Twitter earlier saying airway tree. Yeah, a good try. Yeah, I was, I was ready for it. I like one of my colleagues who I know is listening tonight in this presentation, um, who uh, primed a load of students to say airway yeah, tree to me the other week to try and get me. He got me good and proper. Um, so, yeah, we're going to connect to our airway circuit. It has a name, yeah. If you work for an ambulance service and someone in education has told you to call it an airway tree, then I suggest you just ignore everything they say after that. Yeah, because what they're trying to do is dumb down our profession um, rather than using the proper medical term for something. We're going to connect up to our circuit, which should be built that way in my opinion. Other people might have a different opinion. That's my preferred technique. And then we're going to assess. We've got our eye gel in. Uh, we've, uh, you know, uh, got uh, our airway circuit on. We could ventilate the patient, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, what are we going to do now? What are we looking for? Obviously, we're looking for our slight chest rise. Uh, again, something that mannequins don't encourage. Yeah, we just want a slight rise of the chest. Um, sternal rise is probably too much if we're talking about patients in low flow or no flow states. Um, I put a question in the middle one there, you know, auscultation. You know, it's commonly thought to, you know, when you put an eye gel in to auscultate, but what are we auscultating for? Yeah, if you've got chest rise, then, you know, why are we auscultating? You can't get an eye gel into the right main bronchus like you can with intubation. So why are we comparing the two sides of the chest? Uh, maybe we're looking for air entry and so on. Uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that we, you know, we're doing things that maybe don't have any clinical benefit immediately. If we've got a bilateral chest rise, then you know, there might be a question as to why we're auscultating with eye gel. I'm sure we, I'm sure you could come up with some reasons why we would, uh, but I'm just sort of uh, making the point as to, you know, well, I'm thinking it's a hangover from uh, uh, intubation. Uh, and absolutely then, obviously, waveform capnography uh, should be used absolutely. Although, of course, the coroner's ruling in the UK around waveform capnography in ambulances only reflects uh, intubation. Um, but we now uh, have it as our normal practice for airway devices. We get in there, we get in there. Uh, securing, yeah, then uh, obviously if you're a posh ambulance service, 
Uh, it'll have the second generation Thomas ET tube holders with a yellow bit in uh, that uh, allow you to get an eye gel into them. Um, note what people uh, commonly don't see is the little nose symbol on the bottom of them that tell you which, which way the right, uh, which way is the right way up. I'm not sure the original ones had that, but it's quite quite neat. Um, but I have seen it with eye gels. We're going to talk about what makes eye gels fail in a minute. But I have seen it with eye gels where um, the bite block of the Thomas E. T. tube holder in patients with a smaller mouth uh, makes the eye gel rotate. And of course, we don't need the bite block because the eye gel has a built-in bite block. If you've got patients with quite a small mouth and you put, I've had it where I've had a perfectly sealing eye gel, put the Thomas E. T. tube holder on, lost the seal on the eye gel, taking it off and the seals come back. Uh, I think it reflects the, the size of the bite block in a small mouth. So, uh, or we can tie it in, but generally it needs to be tied in quite tight. Uh, it needs to be sort of pulled into the right spot uh, or possibly tape. Yeah, um, and particularly in pediatrics, that's uh, very common to use um, sticky tape uh, around the device and across the face. Uh, or the reflection at the bottom is hand. Yeah, certainly early in a cardiac arrest, if I'm on airway, then I like to manipulate and tinker around with the eye gel a little bit. So I'm not overly excited about tying the thing in at all or securing it um, immediately until I'm really happy with it and need to do something else or if we're going to move the patient. Yeah, um, but, uh, you know, um, um, securing it is not an immediate uh, thing if you've actually got hold of the thing. Um, so I don't really have any major dramas there. Um, someone's saying they've got the eye gel deluxes. Yeah, the O2 model, which comes with the head strap. Yeah, but they cost about a pound more, so um, ambulance services don't buy them. In fact, it comes also with the OG tube and the lube and everything else. They're really neat. Uh, commonly, more commonly seen in hospitals and resource trolleys. How can we optimize? Yeah, by uh, I don't like to look at the waveform, so I look at our entitled waveform and say I can optimize the airway when the eye gel is in. Yeah, and we do see quite a positional thing with eye gels. We've had a couple of really nice cases where. Uh, we've turned up, the patient's got the right size eye gel in, but quite a poor waveform. And it's just been a little bit of manipulation of the head. That's all they've needed. Either a bit of jaw thrust or a bit of head tilt or just their head repositioning and all of a sudden the waveform's perfect. So they are quite positional that way. We definitely need to be careful uh, that the patient's head isn't flopping around all over the place and so on. Yeah, and... Uh... You know, and uh, you know, position is important, so watch the waveform. And these are the two cautions, really, that I, um, uh, I talk about people quite a lot with eye gel. Next thing, you've got an eye gel in your hand, hold it at both ends and twist the top end, twist the end that would be at the patient's lips. And what's what happens at the bottom end? We saw from the diagram of the eye gel that the uh, eye gel is very rigid, and that's what makes it um, easier to insert is rigidity. What that means is what happens at the top of the eye gel also happens at the bottom. So if you get twist at the top of the eye gel, that also twists the cuff at the bottom and can break the seal, particularly if the seal's marginal. And if the eye gel goes side to side in the mouth, it's the weight of the airway circuits hanging on it and the eye gel gets dragged over, that can also break the seal. Yeah, so really the eye gel needs to stay central and straight in order to maintain the best seal. And in some patients where the seal is slightly marginal, definitely more than others. If you lose seal, check the position eye gel. Obviously, we're going to ventilate with a clinical mindset. Yeah, ventilation volumes are more impactful on cardiac arrest survival probably than uh, anything about which airway device you use. Yeah, so definitely are sort of six to eight mils a kilo absolute maximum. The bottom end of that probably in low flow and no flow states. Uh, with the bag valve mass being operated by a skilled and experienced provider, not just some random bystander yeah because we know as we all know you know probably positive pressure ventilation is one of the most invasive things we do for patients physiology so what about the gastric port well we know it's going to let excess pressure out yeah which is uh you know really good uh we're also probably all aware that the size one eye gel doesn't have a gastric port i don't think there's a clinical reason for that it's just the size one eye gel the two to five kilo neonate one is so tiny that you can't get a gastric port in it. So that's the reason it doesn't have one, I think, more than it, more than anything else. Uh, so um, what can we do with that? We can use a suction catheter down it. I did that the other day. Yeah, you get the patient, what I call, you know, the patient's just a bit fluidy. You get a sort of a <laughs> noise uh, on ventilation. So we'll pass the suction catheter, um, depending on the size, sort of anything 
10 to 14 French gauge, according to the manufacturer's stuff. Um, they tend to find the bigger ones stick. You've got to lube them to get them down there, definitely. But it only needs to be at the bottom of the eye gel and then on suction on low, gets rid of fluids. Uh, or again, in uh, I think London is the only place I have it as standard still, where an actual OG tube will be passed down the uh, uh, down the eye gel to uh, get rid of that sort of um, gastric insufflation and splintage of the diaphragm and sort of uh, catch any fluids. So that can be useful. It isn't always required, but sometimes it is. They can be very easily dislodged. One of the pros about eye gel, we've already said, is that it can go in quite easily, although it can be problematic. Yeah, but it can also be dislodged easily. It doesn't have a cuff to keep it in place. Yeah, so either really good aggressive chest compressions uh, or having a mechanical CPR device on the Lucas can bump the eye gel back out. Uh, and definitely on patient movement. Yes, the patient needs to be well secured. Uh, and as we all know, every time we do some sort of move for the patient, we're then going to do our reassessment and inspect the airway and make sure the device is still in uh, well. So uh, obviously, end tidal being the best thing for that. Watch our end tidal. Any changes to that, first thing we're going to look at is probably has the eye gel become dislodged. Uh, what if it's no longer tolerated? What if you, you know, uh, get a ROSC and a patient starts to come around and is no longer tolerating the eye gel as well? Um, I think we have to be careful not to take it out too soon. Yeah, um, it, it, it is protecting the airway. It's going to be, you know, reasonably well tolerated. Anyone will tolerate an OP airway will tolerate an eye gel. Um, you know, we don't want to risk losing the airway and having the risk of reinserting it uh, when the patient's got uh, more tone and you might not be able to get it back in, but you might not have an airway uh, and so on. So we're definitely going to wait. We're not going to rush to take it out. Yeah, if the patient's trying to reject it, uh, if the patient particularly is localizing the hands coming up, you know, because they want the thing out, then that seems appropriate. We may suction through the eye gel, we may suction around the eye gel, uh, but uh, yeah, we're going to take it out when we need to. Uh, and finally, we've got uh, in our closing slide. So, you know, uh, an eye gel, in summary, the eye gel is a really, really, really good pre hospital airway device. Um, for particularly for out of hospital or cardiac arrest. Uh, but if someone teaches you it's an easy device, then this is probably what you need to tell them. Yeah, it's a device that requires a significant amount of knowledge and a significant amount of maintenance to use it to its maximum and to get those sort of really high success rates that we know can uh, be achieved. And we will probably take some questions. Are you there, Andy? Uh, I am indeed, Jamie. Yes, I've just uh, requested to take back uh, the host, and so um, because for some reason it didn't let me. So anyway, I think it's done it now. So that's good. Uh, I'm going to let you quickly look through the questions and answers, Jamie, because there's a million of them, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure that the fabulous folk of this evening don't want to sit here till half past with you answering questions. So I want to let you quickly skim through the Q and A's and click the ones that you want to answer live. Uh, and I've got a couple of quick thank yous to do while you do that. So Simon Sayer, thank you so much, mate. I saw that link in the chat. Uh, you'll have to scroll up a little bit now to find it. Uh, but there's a great link there through to the um, devices and some guides on like a really, really good PDF, uh, which I managed to download. So thank you so much for that. I have just popped some links for some feedback on Trustpilot and Google and App Store because we've always got our two £20 vouchers to give away, £25 vouchers, I always say that. And then more importantly... More importantly, for Jamie's feedback and for the CPD circle, there is another link now, which is literally online. And the um, what we want you to do is complete that link and just tell us whether tonight's presentation will influence or change your practice moving forward, because that helps us support making sure that we bring the right CPD to you. And we also give that anonymized to Jamie to make sure that he's ticked all the boxes in tonight's presentation. Uh, and before I hand over to Jamie's question answers, have you managed to find the, the answer live ones, Jamie? I can see the answer. I can see the question and answer box. Yeah. Yeah. So gonna, if, you, if you click on the answer live option, I'll read them out for you because otherwise we'll be like hours, hours. So uh, oh, right, I can, uh, I can, I can see them and uh, yeah, you want me yeah, to we'll uh, sit and type uh, them in. I'll, I'll sit and type them in now. Yeah. Uh, so, I just brought the uh, last slide up. If you can see it, that's a uh, a uh, an advert for my uh, presentation next month. The A to Z of meaningless ambulance interventions. Shameful. 
shameful. Yeah. <laughs> and all, I, all I can say so far is in trying to find 26 things, I found about 126. <laughs> so uh, I'm struggling to get it down to 26, but I'm working on it. And that is such a risk, isn't it? Because actually, once you start looking, you go oh, down a, can, a wormhole. It's a can of worms, it really oh, yeah. is. Of course yeah. it is. Of course it is, as always. Uh, we have just got 10 new people joined us tonight. So fabulous. It's uh, so a big thank you to uh, Nifua, uh, Walter, Andrew, uh, Sheeb, Ross, Colin, Amelia, Helena, Adam, Kerry, uh, Catherine, and Alex. I promise it will make recording your CPD simple for the rest of your life. And if not, well... I'll 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 come and sit next to you and show you how to use it if I need to. Okay, okay. So, um, question from Billy, uh, unrelated to the current topic regarding your NAEMT post nominal. Have you um, done work within the US? If so, what was the role and how was your experience? Uh, yeah, so I've uh, yeah I've worked uh, with a number of ambulance services in the US on uh, education and uh, spent some uh, time out with different ambulance services. So. Uh, very variable and uh, yeah, very different. Patients are all the same. Um, systems are very different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some exciting things coming on Jamie's next update uh, because we have managed to secure some tickets to um, EMS World in America and we may well be giving them away, including flights and such. So some exciting things coming. I'm not going to tell you too much about it because it gets me a little bit excited. So I'll just leave that there. Plant that seed for the 400 people who are still alive with us and online. Um, so if you do fancy seeing what they do in the States, I can even arrange for you to go and spend a shift on a fire truck. EMS. How's that? How's that? How does that sound? Sounds all right, though, doesn't it, Jamie? Sounds good. Uh, do, do, do. We've got another question from... Um, oh, gosh, where have I just found it? Uh... M. Bracken, would you have a link for your airway course? Jamie, tell us about your airway course. No, I don't like to plug things. You know that. Oh. You're the plugger here, Andy. God. Oh. Well, I'll tell you uh, what. Just, maybe, just maybe search, you... For, search for difficult airway course EMS. You'll find us. There you go. Uh, there you at go. the, uh, the com. If you can't find it, we'll make sure we get the link in your follow-up email that comes tomorrow. Um, Chris, forget stuff to post out. Chris, I think we've sent it to another Chris. That's a problem uh, somewhere in the chat, and it's gone somewhere else. And I think someone sent it back to us. And so, and then of course we've got Royal Mail doing things with postals and packages and all sorts. Oh, thank you very much, Kieran. Look at that. Kieran's perfectly plugged you there, Jamie. I don't even need to do it for you. Got, got a link up for the airway course. It's very well done. He has. He's, he's, he's done it right. So let me just share my screen and we'll wrap things up. So I have just popped the link into the chat for the feedback for Jamie. Really important uh, you get that feedback across us because it supports Jamie's CPD along with everything else. Members notice you will get your CPD certificates tomorrow. So please, you don't need to email us or messages. They will absolutely guarantee you will need to be a premium member though for your CPD certificate to arrive. And that will come first thing in the morning. If you did miss any of tonight's presentation, it is available on YouTube until tomorrow. So please jump across onto YouTube and then you can capture that and see what you've missed out on. Um, quick question coming from Dave. Jamie, what are your views on first responders, police, fire, etc., using these airways? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we teach places where they where they use them, and I see firefighters using them uh, in in our region. And uh, you know, I think that it's definitely appropriate if given a suitable education. Uh, I think there's definitely a safety factor in there as well. I think uh, with an appropriately sized and placed eye gel, actually the risk of gastric insufflation um, is probably safer than uh, over aggressive, badly done bag mass ventilation. So. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in a, in, in, with, with suitable education, it's absolutely, absolutely appropriate. Fab. And just to, just to highlight that, I was recently at an absolutely horrific job and there was nobody there to back me up. And the only people who arrived to back me up were some police uh, armed response who uh, managed this patient's airway exceptionally well, pointed out to me that uh, one of the patients had started to develop trismus, uh, who was unresponsive, and managed to get an airway in far quicker than I could have even got to that patient had because I was dealing with a, another poorly. So uh, I was exceptionally surprised, and I actually wrote a letter to the police superintendent afterwards and said, wow, your police medic absolutely saved that patient's life. But to hear the word trismus come out of a police medic um, arm response guy's mouth was the strangest thing I've ever read in my entire career. But he was right. He recognized it, used an airway appropriately, and um, we managed to get an output of the patient. So there's my happy ending story. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for tonight. Fabulous work yet again. Not a problem. Uh, now, we can, but... now we can see you. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone enjoyed it. So thank you everyone for attending and 
we'll uh, see you uh, yeah, next month for the uh, A to Z of meaningless ambulance interventions. And of course, GMA has got lots of webinars along with some of our other presenters across on our website. So please go across to cpdme.com, click on the webinars tab, and there are lots and lots and lots of CPD there to fill your 2023 calendar. So on behalf of myself and all the amazing team here at CPDME, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks all. Thanks, Take Andy. Care. Bye now.